Have you ever wished that you could spot a bubble in real time with a high degree of accuracy? Because it's very easy to tell after the fact, especially a few years removed, you can point back at something and say, clearly that was a bubble. But if it was so clear in the moment, then it wouldn't have ever become a bubble because nobody would have invested in it because they would have known it was just a bubble. And so I'm going to give you five steps that you can use to test a litmus test to be able to determine whether something is a bubble or not. Ready? Let's dive in. My name is Joe Brown. This is the Heresy Financial Show, and I make these videos to help you learn how money works so that you can make more, save more, and give more. And part of that is avoiding things that are going to lose you tons of money, like bubbles. And so over the years, I've developed five heuristics that have helped me analyze what's going on to determine whether something is a bubble. And it's important and helpful to have heuristics during times like these because emotion sets in very easily and can cloud your judgment, especially given what usually accompanies bubbles, which is we're going to go into in these five steps. So number one, the first test to spot a bubble is that average people are getting above average returns. So what is an average person? There are a couple of different ways to tell. Number one, you know some people who you look at and you would never say this to their face probably, but you look at them and you think, yeah, in pretty much every area, you're pretty average. Especially given some of the bubbles we've seen emerge over the past you know, three or four years, you know some people who got caught up in every single one of those bubbles. You know some people who were buying the ICOs in 2017. You know some people who were buying the SPACs in 2020. You know some people who were buying the NFTs in 2021. And many times, these are the same people. And so you've got average people, which by the way, that's not an insult. Most people are average in most areas of their life. There's very few people who are not average in most areas of their life. Or you have expertise in certain areas. And so when I say average people getting above average returns, I'm saying, hey, this is somebody that outside of their area of expertise, they're making massive above average returns. And it doesn't have to be a big dollar amount, but it does have to be above average returns percentage wise. Now you might ask, how can you know if it is outside of their area of expertise? And it's because, well, I know this person is an Uber driver. I know this person is a sales clerk. I know this person is a secretary. I know this person is a teacher. And yet they were dabbling in all these different investments that returned you know, massive amounts of money before they collapsed. And so you can identify these people and nine times out of 10, they're gonna get sucked into the very next bubble that comes along as well. So average people getting above average returns. That is red flag number one for a bubble. Number two, you experience a high degree of FOMO and or euphoria. And when I say this, I actually do mean you. I don't mean looking at other people. And the reason why is because it allows you to check your emotions on this. Because if you're looking at a sector, an industry, a new investment type, whatever it is, and you haven't gotten into it, you hear about a lot of people making money and you feel a fear of missing out on that. And you are drawn to make an investment out of that fear of missing out on those gains. That's a red flag. Now I say FOMO and or euphoria because you might've gotten into to it initially. And so you might have been one of the ones that got into it. And because you got in early and because you're making a lot of money, you feel a sense of euphoria inside. You start checking your account balance and your account value and your returns, your gains every single day, maybe every single hour. You start thinking, man, this keeps going. These are the things that I'm going to be able to buy with this. This is when I'm going to be able to quit my job with this. These are the things I'm going to be able to do this, do it this money. That's the sense of euphoria setting in that is a huge red flag. And at that point, it might be the hardest thing to do, but that is a huge red flag that there is some sort of above average return happening that is indicative of a bubble 
which means that you should probably get out. Not definitely, but it is a very big red flag. So if you're out of it, you see others and you experience the FOMO, or if you're in it and it's going up, you experience the euphoria. Those are the two emotions to check in your mind to determine whether something is in a bubble or not. So that's number two. Number three, little to no institutional adoption. If it's just a bunch of regular people, this is a massive red flag. So ICOs, NFTs. Now, the example of the SPAC, the Special Purpose Acquisition Company, a lot of them were going public. This looked like institutional adoption of a new way for companies to go public. They were experiencing lots of gains every time one was formed. However, many times when companies go public, that is institutions offloading onto investors onto retail people, onto average people. That's not the institutions keeping that themselves. And so this is a big sign to watch out for. Are the big boys, the big money, the institutions investing in these things, whether it's an ICO or a SPAC or an NFT or whatever it is, if it's not the big money investing in it and you're currently seeing there are lots of gains, that's a big sign that it's a bubble because the big boys don't jump in when things are richly valued. They jump in when all the retail guys are licking their wounds because they just sold at massive losses. So that is the third sign to spot a bubble, little to no institutional adoption. Number four is a macro indicator, and this one is an easy money environment. So when interest rates are very low, when the money supply is growing very quickly, when money is being spent by the government hand over fist, taxes are low, it's an abundance environment where everybody feels rich, where everybody's spending a lot of money, where it's easy to borrow, cheap to borrow. These are easy money environments. It is ripe for fraud, ripe for people coming out saying, hey, this is the next big thing that is going to make a ton of people rich. And in those environments, bubbles form all over the place. And pretty much every single time in history where you see the biggest Ponzi schemes, the biggest frauds, those are on the backs of the easiest money environments. Because if it's not an easy money environment and money is tight and borrowing is expensive, those are the circumstances where people have to weigh things very carefully and say, hey, hey, this is going to be expensive, so it's going to be a big risk for me. So I need to make sure I set the bar high so I get a real good return on my money here. And so you're not going to have all those investments in the money losers or the speculative things or the things that might win big or might lose big. You're going to have, by and large, a lot more people being very careful with their money. And there's less of a chance for those euphoric bubbles to form. And number five, the movement in price is artificial or unsustainable given the supply and demand. So many times this can be difficult to determine the supply and demand of something. But one key indicator you're looking for is whether something can be infinite or not. And so a good example of this is the original bubble, the tulip bubble, how tulips skyrocketed in prices. There were new markets like futures markets created around tulips. But tulips are something that are theoretically infinite in supply because all you have to do is have a bunch of people start to plant them and grow them, which could instantly drop the price because at the end of the day, it always comes back down to supply and demand. A modern day example is something where this might be a little bit controversial, I don't know, but the price of diamonds, because diamonds, the supply is artificially constrained by one company that controls a supply and they can be grown in labs. And so they're artificially high based on a constrained supply and a lack of people deciding to make them because of cultural bias towards getting them from the one place where the supply is being restricted from. But given all of the natural factors and the fact that diamonds have only been valuable for, you know, like 60 years throughout history, they were never valuable before they burn up in a fire. The supply and demand thing there is not as good as something like other actual gemstones that are rocks, precious metals like gold. And so that would be something where you can say, okay, the supply and demand, it's artificially created. It's unsustainable given the natural forces of history or chemistry or whatever it is. 
And then other things you can apply that to, like whether it's like, you know, NFTs, actually infinite, right? Because you can have an infinite number of those JPEGs or an infinite number of those copies of that NFT or whatever it is. So you have to look at the supply and demand imbalances there to determine whether that move is either artificially created or unsustainable given the natural supply and demand that exists. And by the way, you can flip that on its head too and identify things that are extremely undervalued as well. So I hope that's helpful. And by the way, I have just a few days left on my first week launch sale for my portfolio allocation course. So if you're interested in learning how you can invest in a way where you don't have to worry about massive losses in your portfolio, that's what I've designed this course for. And it's 40% off just for the next couple of days only just for this first week. You can find that link in the description below. As always, I really appreciate you guys. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great day.